The Peter Schiff Show. Well, we have some key primary elections coming up tomorrow, and I wanted to take an opportunity to do a podcast on Donald Trump and the Trump phenomena. You know, a lot of people are under the impression that I'm endorsing Donald Trump because I have said some positive things about him and his campaign. But I wanted to make it clear that I am not doing that. I mean, I'm not convinced that he's going to be a good president, although it's possible that he could. I think there's no chance that Hillary Clinton would be a good president. I pr I'm pretty sure that's clear. Uh, but Donald Trump is a wild card. But I do have a lot of problems with much of what Donald Trump says. What I think is more telling is the fact that he does have so much support, and that's because he is tapping in uh, to a vein uh, in the Republican Party, and in fact, outside the Republican Party, because he is getting uh, independents, he's getting Democrats to cross over and vote in Republican primaries because of the things that he is saying that so many people find so appealing because the country is in much worse shape than the media or the Federal Reserve or uh, Congress is, is leading people to believe. Everybody keeps talking about the recovery, including President Obama, but the people who are showing up for Trump at these rallies, they know there's no recovery. In fact, the economy is actually in worse shape than even Donald Trump recognizes. But at least Donald Trump is talking about the enormity of the problems. He's right. America isn't great. Right? He wants to make it great again. There are a lot of people who are in denial. They say we don't have to make America great again because it's still great. No, it's not. Based on any way you want to measure uh, the U.S. economy, and certainly if you want to compare it uh, to its prior self, it is far from great. And Donald Trump recognizes that America has lost her greatness, and he wants to restore it. And of course, the voters want to make America great again, and they believe Donald Trump can do it. And Donald Trump probably believes he can do it. And that is part of the problem, because Trump can't make America great again only free market capitalism can make America great again. And I'm not sure that Donald Trump understands this. I mean, Donald Trump believes that America is in trouble because we're run by a bunch of idiots, by incompetent people who are in charge of the country. And he's right about that. They are incompetent. But just changing uh, the politicians, having more competent leaders is not going to uh, make America great again. Because if we have big government, it doesn't matter whether Donald Trump is in charge or the current crop of politicians. There is no way to make big government work. If you have smarter people who are uh, at the helm, it doesn't mean that they're going to steer this massive ship any straighter. You see, Donald Trump believes that because he's successful in business— and he's run a company and built a high net worth that he can run the U.S. government and make it profitable for American citizens. He thinks he can get in there and get rid of all the waste and the fraud and abuse. And he's going to bring in smarter people and we're going to negotiate better trade deals. And this is going to bring all of our jobs back. And this is going to make America great again. And none of that is true. You know, we don't need better negotiators. We don't need trade deals. We just need free trade. The problem with these trade deals is that they're not free. They're managed. There's all sorts of nonsense in these agreements. But the fact that America has huge trade deficits and the fact that we're losing all of the high paying manufacturing jobs is not because we got outsmarted by the Chinese in negotiations. The trade deficits are a symptom of the problem. They are not the cause of the problem. The reason that we have deficits with everybody is not because we have bad trade deals. It's because we have too much government. And even if Donald Trump is the leader of all that government, he's not going to make it work any better. What Trump needs to do is talk about how he is going to dismantle government. Not how he's going to make America great again, but how the American people will make America great again if they're freed from government. And if um, Donald Trump is going to go to Washington to remove all the shackles, to dismantle all the regulations and the spending and the taxes 
that are the source of our problem, then America can be great again. But if we're going to try to maintain all this government, and I know he talks about small cuts around the edges, but Trump wants to spend more on the military, not less. He wants to spend more on Social Security. He doesn't want to make any cuts to Social Security, which means we're going to spend more. He wants to spend more on taking care of our veterans. I don't know how much more, but he keeps talking about how we're not spending enough on vets and we're going to spend more. So he, he's not talking about making the government smaller. He just thinks he's going to make it more efficient. Well, it's impossible. Government can never be efficient because it's not a private company. But I think Donald Trump does have a large enough ego uh, that he actually thinks that he can make this work, that if we just put him in charge, that everything is going to be good. And I think a lot of voters believe that, too. And I want to talk about one thing in particular on this uh, blog, and that's tariffs and free trade. Now, Trump keeps saying, oh, I believe in free trade, but I just need to make it fair. Well, how do you make it fair? If it's free, it's automatically fair. He wants to impose tariffs, uh, particularly he calls out the Chinese or the Mexicans. And he's 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 put out numbers, 40 percent tariffs. And he's, you know, maybe could be a little higher, could be a little lower. But let me talk about what would happen, because he says, I'm going to put these tariffs or I'm just going to threaten to put these tariffs. And then we're going to bring all of our jobs back. Right. All the jobs that we lost, all these high paying jobs are just going to come back to America if we elect Donald Trump and he gets tough with the Chinese, gets tough uh, with the Mexicans, we, we put Carl Icahn there on the other side of the table and he just negotiates this fantastic deal. Right. This is what they believe. None of this is possible. First of all, even if we imposed tariffs on China, for example, what's going to happen? It's not going to be all of a sudden we're going to start making all those products ourselves. I mean, first of all, China is not the only country we have a trade deficit with. We have a trade deficit with everybody. And so to the extent that we have tariffs on Chinese goods, we're just going to have to import goods from other countries that weren't our first choice because maybe the Chinese were giving us a better deal. But if there's a tariff on Chinese products, maybe uh, Korea is giving us a better deal or maybe Malaysia or, or, or maybe Indonesia or, you know, who, who knows what other country might be making something that we're going to buy because China is going to be too expensive. And so our next lowest cost option uh, will be some other country that right now is losing out to China because China is giving us a better deal. But all that means is that if we have to import from a country that isn't giving us as good a deal as China was, we're just going to have to spend more money for the things that we import. We're not going to just start making them ourselves. And so all that's going to do is make life more miserable for the people who are voting for Trump to make America great again, because all that's going to happen is their cost of living is going to go up. They're not going to get their high you know, paying jobs back, but the jobs they do have, the pay is going to go a lot less far because now the goods that they need to buy are going to be more expensive thanks to those tariffs. Now, let's say Trump decides to get around this. Let's just have a tariff on every country. Let's have a 40 percent tariff across the board. So we just can't start importing from Vietnam what we used to import from China. We're just going to have this 40 percent tariffs across the board. And that's somehow going to bring our jobs back. No, it won't. And let me explain why it doesn't work. First of all, let's assume that I am a U.S. company and I'm manufacturing in the United States right now. And I'm thinking about moving my manufacturing abroad uh, because it's going to be cheaper. Now, if you put the tariffs on now, obviously, some of the companies that were thinking about relocating abroad may decide not to do it. So it's possible that those tariffs could keep some factories open that otherwise might have shut down, but not necessarily, because let's say I'm manufacturing something. But a lot of my components that go into the manufacturing process, a lot of what I assemble, a lot of these parts are imported. So I import a bunch of parts and then we put them together here in a factory and then we sell them. And a lot of that stuff gets re-exported. Now, let's say all of a sudden we slap that tariff on and now all my parts that I'm importing get 40 percent more expensive. So that means my finished product in the United States is going to be a lot more expensive. And now when I go to re-export that product, it may lo no longer be competitive on the global market because I'm having to pay 
40% more for all these components that my competitors aren't having to pay all that extra for because they don't have the tariffs. Now, all of a sudden, a U.S. factory may have a greater incentive to relocate overseas because now it can buy all those components without having to pay the tariff. Now, yes, it can't sell them into the U.S. market uh, without having to get hit with those tariffs. But if the global market is more important and it wants access to the global market in a competitive way, then you've actually created an incentive, an additional incentive to relocate offshore. Now, I suppose somebody could say, well, they can start making all their parts, right? They can start making all their parts domestically as well, but that's not going to fly because that won't be competitive internationally. Now, maybe it will be competitive domestically in a much smaller U.S. market because everybody is going to have to face those same tariffs. But if the company wants to maintain their global competitiveness, then to the extent that they're manufacturing for the global market, they're going to have to move those facilities offshore as as opposed to the U.S. So the only thing that those tariffs are going to do is maybe protect some jobs to the extent that a company is manufacturing exclusively for the U.S. market. And there's probably not that many businesses uh, that are doing that. But first of all, now you have to look at the impact of the higher prices on the domestic market because American workers don't have an unlimited amount of money. And it's not like if all of a sudden there's these 40% tariffs that are imposed on foreign companies. If all of a sudden the goods that we're importing become very expensive and so Americans can't afford them, it's not like we're just going to start making those goods in the United States because the factories don't exist. The trained workers don't exist. And who's going to build the factories? Who's going to train the workers? Because A, assuming that you could make the investment in, in building the factories and training the workers, are the prices for the products going to be low enough that American consumers can still afford to buy them? We don't know. I mean, it still might be cheaper to pay the tariff than to buy the domestically produced products. But the other point is this, and this is critical. What company in their right mind is going to spend the money necessary to make the investment in a new factory and training a bunch of workers when the only reason that this factory may in fact be viable, may, is because of a tariff, which can be eliminated at any point by any future administration, right? Even if Donald Trump puts a tariff in, that tariff is not there forever. And so why would a business, based on a new tariff that was just imposed, what if Donald Trump is a one-term president? You know, or what if even Donald Trump decides that, you know, the tariff was a bad idea uh, and two years later, they decide to uh, get rid of it? Well, as a uh, businessman or the owner of a company, I'm going to commit millions of dollars, maybe tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars to building a gigantic factory and training and hiring a bunch of workers, all based on the fact that there's a tariff. And how I have no idea how long that tariff is going to be there and if that tariff is going to be taken away at any moment, rendering my entire investment worthless. Nobody is going to do it. But also one of the things that Trump is overlooking is the impact that a 40 percent increase in consumer prices. What does that mean for the American economy? Because, first of all, to the extent that Americans continue to spend money on imports because you know, they can't spend money on domestically produced stuff because there is no domestically produced stuff, at least not yet. Assuming that we can retool, assuming somebody does make the investment, despite the uncertainty of how long the tariffs will be there, even if somebody is going to build the plant and equipment and train the workforce, all that's going to take time. So what's going to happen during the interim to the extent that Americans continue to buy uh, some foreign made products, they're going to spend a lot more money on them. And so that means they're going to buy less stuff, right? Because they don't have an unlimited amount of money. So they're going to buy less stuff. Uh, that means the government's not going to necessarily collect a lot of money in the tariff because what's going to happen is a lot of products that used to be uh, imported are no longer going to be imported. And so they're not going to be sold. There will be some money collected in tariffs, but it may be offset by a lot of the sales taxes that, local governments no longer get because businesses are selling 
fewer products because the prices are much higher and so the consumer is not buying as much stuff. And because the consumer is not going to be buying as much stuff, that means a lot of businesses that are in the business of selling stuff are not going to sell as much stuff. And so they're not going to have as much of a profit. And so what they're going to do is start cutting back as well, because if, they're, if their customers are buying less, then they need less. They don't need as big a store. They don't need as many employees to sell less stuff. So you start to get layoffs throughout the U.S. economy as Americans are forced to reduce their consumption because everything they want to buy is that much more expensive. And again, even if Americans continue to spend a certain amount of money on imports, that means they have less money to spend on other things. And maybe some of those other things were domestically supplied, most likely services. So if I have to spend more money on imported foreign goods, I have less money to spend on domestically provided services. And now there's going to be job losses in those sectors of the economy. Because if you dramatically reduce the purchasing power of American consumers by artificially inflating uh, the prices of all the things that they buy, you're going to have a big contraction in the GDP. A lot of our GDP is in the service sector, but the services are there to service the products that are imported. Well, if we're not importing as many products because they're much more expensive and therefore fewer Americans could buy them, uh, then it's going to have a domino effect. And of course, once people are out of work, they're not buying anything, right? And also you're going to have this huge increase in the amount of people who are now unemployed, who are looking for unemployment benefits or welfare benefits. And so now the budget deficit starts to go up and it's just going to be a domino effect of bad things happening. Now, look, a lot of people like to blame the depression on Smoot-Harley. And of course, Smoot-Harley tariffs, that didn't help. Right. But that wasn't the actual underlying cause of the Great Depression. What caused it was government trying to micromanage the economy. It was Herbert Hoover and then Franklin Roosevelt, who didn't want the free market to function, but who tried to micromanage uh, the recovery process. And of course, they screwed it up and they turned it into a into a depression. The origins of that problem was bad monetary policy at the Fed. It was the Fed being too loose, keeping interest rates too low, and inflating a stock market bubble and, to a lesser extent, a real estate bubble. And when those bubbles popped, instead of just doing nothing and allowing the market to fix what the Federal Reserve broke, which is what they did uh, in 1920 when you had a similar situation where they printed too much money because of World War I and kept interest rates too low, and then they, they stopped that and we, we had a big contraction in 1920, the government did nothing and the free market worked. But when we had another drop in 1929, Hoover couldn't resist the urge to intervene. And then uh, Roosevelt, who initially criticized the intervention policies of Hoover, basically when he ran, he not only adopted them, but expanded them. And that's why the problem got so bad. But the tariffs certainly made things worse. But we've got even bigger problems now than we had then. And I think tariffs now given how bad the other problems are, would be an even bigger mistake to impose them now than it was to do it uh, back in the 1930s. See, the only way we're going to bring jobs back to the United States is to have real, substantive, structural changes with the United States. What does that mean? That means massive deregulation of uh, business. That means big reductions in taxes. That means big reductions in government spending, because that's the only way to finance the big reductions in taxes. And it also means reforming the Federal Reserve because we need much higher interest rates and we're going to have to have much higher interest rates. So there's going to be a huge restructuring that is going to be necessary in order to make American business competitive again. We're going to have to go into all of these the liabilities that we expose American employers to. All these special rights and special privileges that have been granted to so many special interest groups, guaranteeing that they're not going to be discriminated against, that they're going to have uh, a hassle-free environment, uh, you know, all the things that have been done to make employing Americans so expensive and so risky, all this stuff is going to have to change if American manufacturers, American businesses are going to be in a position where they can produce goods in a globally competitive manner. But that's really none of that is what is what Trump is talking about. He's just talking about 
Let me go in there. Let me negotiate these great deals. And we're going to bring all these jobs back. And none of these jobs are going to come back. Right. Because if we had perfect free trade, I mean, what? that's the best deal. The best deal that you can negotiate is 100 percent free trade. Just a piece of paper. Right. One one piece of paper. Sign it. And just says free trade. Right. No tariffs on anything. Everything, anything you produce can be imported and exported without any tariffs. Right. That, that's all you really need. What we get now are all kinds of deals where there's a bunch of special interest groups that have their their two cents in there. But if what Trump wants to do is have a deal where there's some type of penalty that we impose on foreign countries to artificially you know, infl- inflate the, the cost of their goods so that somehow we have some kind of an edge, that, does, that doesn't give it us an edge. You know, one of the things that Donald Trump is talking about is the foreign exchange rates. And he says, look, these other countries, their currencies are too low. And, and that's the problem, that they're, that, they're, that, that they're able to outcompete because of the low currency. And, you know, in a way, he does have a point in that the dollar is overvalued because of its reserve currency status. And if it weren't for that status, the dollar would be much lower. But that in and of itself wouldn't turn around our trade situation. In fact, it might exacerbate it. It just might mean that all the things that we have to buy are that much more expensive and we get less for the stuff we sell. So our terms of trade would actually worsen. And in fact, when America used to have large trade surpluses, the dollar was much stronger than it is today. But the dollar is going to have to come down, but that by itself is not going to turn the situation around because we have bigger issues than the exchange rate. We've got to bring down the cost of production. We've got to bring down the cost of litigation. We've got to bring down our tax rates. And we've got to get a skilled workforce, which we no longer have. We don't have people that have the skills that are necessary. And of course, we have to do it in a non-unionized way. We can't have the types of labor unions that help to destroy all of these big businesses. I mean, it's no accident that a lot of these Midwestern states that used to be so heavily industrialized, that all those businesses were heavily unionized. And a lot of the people who are now wanting to vote for Donald Trump are maybe union guys or ex-union guys that want those those jobs back. But those jobs are not going to come back under those same terms because it was the unions that helped to destroy those jobs by artificially increasing uh, the level of compensation or labor costs, creating an incentive for these companies to go abroad. And when you combine the the extortionist demands of the, the labor unions with the demands and the cost imposed on by government, it was a two-pronged attack on these businesses. But, you know, protectionism, if you go back and look at the, the earlier proponents of protectionism, you have to have a U.S. industry to protect Many of the U.S. industries, it's too late to protect them. They're gone. Right? I mean, it's not like we make them think, what about, let's say, uh, television sets or, or radios or, or cameras? Right? It is, if we want to protect American camera manufacturers from foreign competition, can we put tariffs on, on Japanese cameras or Chinese cameras to protect the American manufacturers? No, because the Americans, don't, we don't manufacture this stuff anymore. And if we make it prohibitively expensive to import foreign cameras, does that mean that all of a sudden we're just going to start making them? No. If, we could, if it was that easy, we'd be making them already. Now, if they're now so expensive that, all right, now let's go ahead and let's build a factory to start making cameras. A, how are you going to build a factory to make cameras when your only market is America, right? Because obviously... No one in the rest of the world is going to buy our overpriced cameras, right? Because they're just going to buy the cheaper ones that are made in these other countries, right? So we're going to have to build factories where the only customers are Americans, which immediately you're going to diminish your market, right? Because you don't have the whole rest of the world that you can can innovate or, or market to. You're just making for Americans. And, and so, and how are you going to find that market? What is the American market going to be like? Uh, for these cameras, they're going to be much more expensive. And then you're going to have to deal with, what, a black market? 
people like going taking vacations and while you're out of the country people are going to start buying their cameras right while they're out of the country and just sneaking them in they're just not going to declare them coming through customs you might or you'll have people selling you know illegally imported cameras that are that are that are you know because the foreign ones will be so much cheaper and they'll be a lot better because the manufacturers there have the entire world uh, as their customer base, whereas American manufacturers can only sell to Americans because we have this big protected market. And, and of course, you're not going to have all the innovation. You're not going to have any of the stuff that you'd have in a globally competitive market. I mean, all, what, what Trump is talking about doing, building these walls, not literal walls like the one he wants to build south of the border. And by the way, you know, he says that he's going to make Mexico pay for that wall. How is he going to make Mexico pay for the wall? By imposing tariffs on products imported uh, from Mexico. Well, Mexico doesn't pay that bill. Americans pay that bill. If an American wants to buy a Mexican product, he's got to pay uh, a tariff. And if he doesn't want to pay the tariff, well, then he doesn't buy the product. So you could say, well, Mexico will lose the sale. All right, well, they'll sell it to somebody else. They'll sell it to the next highest bidder. So somebody in America won't get that product. So somebody in another country will get that product. The Americans are the losers because there's a product that we wanted to get that either we have to pay more to buy it and we still buy it. Mexico still gets paid. It's just that the American has to pay a tax on top of what he pays to Mexico or the American doesn't buy it at all, in which case Mexico sells it to the next highest bidder or, you know, they keep it themselves. Maybe some Mexican uh, gets to consume that product. But none of this is going to work. And the unfortunate part is that you've got so many people that are going to be voting uh, for Trump as if he's a savior, as if he can really make America great again. And in fact, if he actually does the things that he's saying he's going to do, then America is going to even be in worse shape. Right now, of course, all this is going to happen anyway. But what happens if Trump goes in and make America great and it fails? Then what do we try? What, then who are we going to blame? I mean, are they just going to blame Trump or are they going to blame all the things that happened before Trump? But what I don't know, and this is the wild card, is maybe Donald Trump is smart enough to know the hot button issues, knowing that everybody is upset because they've lost their jobs or they've lost a good paying job and now they've got a lousy paying job. Donald Trump is one of the only people campaigning that talks about how these unemployment numbers are bogus, how the unemployment rate is meaningless, that the jobs are part time and they don't pay and all the people who have left the labor force. So Donald Trump knows that these are the angry voters that his message is appealing to because in a way he's promising something for nothing, just like Bernie Sanders was promising something for nothing. I am going to solve your problems because I'm smart. I'm a good businessman and everybody else is a bunch of idiots. The country has been led by a bunch of morons, a bunch of incompetence. All that is true, right? But somehow just elect me and I can make this government work. I can make big government work. Maybe I'll make it a little bit less big. But because I have experience as an entrepreneur and I've made a lot of money for myself, I can run everything more efficiently. I can put all our contracts act to bid. I can take over this behemoth. I can rein it in, and I can make this monster work for us instead of work against us. But he doesn't know that that's impossible, or maybe he knows. Maybe he knows it's impossible, and that the only thing that can do is not control the beast, but kill the beast, right? We don't need somebody better to try to ride this monster. We need to put it out of our misery. We need to slay it. We need to kill it. Right? We need to dismantle all of this government and unleash free market capitalism so that it's not Donald Trump that saves us. We save ourselves. Donald Trump just permits that to happen by dismantling all of the impediments and all the roadblocks that prior presidents have put in our path. All, all the governments that have gone before Trump, all the administrations, Congresses, and presidents, all they've done is build the obstacles higher and higher and higher with more regulations and more taxes to the point that there's no way forward. There's no path forward for anybody unless we tear down that wall. That's the wall that we need to tear down is the regulatory wall, the bureaucratic wall, the taxes, the regulations. But Trump probably knows that he doesn't want to also talk about what needs to be done. Right? Because if you're going to make this omelet, there's a lot of eggs that need to be cracked here because there's a lot of people that are benefiting from big government. At least they think they're benefiting because they see the check they get. 
whether it's a, a paycheck because they work for government or a pension check because they're retired from government or a social security check because they're on social security or Medicare or any one of a number of programs or a veteran and they fought for America or they served in the armed forces and now they're getting paid or you're a bondholder and you loan money to the government and you're getting your interest. Everybody has a stake and Donald Trump doesn't want to offend any of these voters because he wants people on Social Security to vote for him. He wants people that, that are collecting government pensions to vote for him. So he doesn't want to talk about having to cut any of this stuff because he doesn't want to lose any of those voters. So maybe he's smart enough to know that what he's saying to get elected maybe has absolutely nothing to do with what he will do if he is elected because he's choosing to pick his battles and he doesn't want to get into all the details. In fact, there's very little details about Trump's policies and maybe that is for a reason. Maybe he doesn't want to give any details because he wants to be free to do something that maybe is not politically popular if he gets elected. So that is where the wild card comes in, that maybe there's more to Trump than meets the eye. Maybe he knows that if he says the things that really need to be done to make America great again, that he won't get elected and he won't be able to make America great again. So in order to get elected and to do the things that need to be done, he has to campaign in a way that will not alienate the voters. So all he wants to do is tap in to their rage and their anger and their frustration and promise a quick fix. But if he gets elected, deliver the bitter tasting medicine that we actually need to swallow in order to cure us of this disease. But if he actually tried to sell the public on that medicine, that they wouldn't want it. So instead, it's a panacea. It's like a weight loss program where you don't really have to diet. You don't really have to exercise. You just, you know, take a pill and everything is going to work. Trump wants to be that pill, right? He wants to be the easy fix and he doesn't want to open up a window where his opponents can easily target him for the cuts that he wants to make, which is one of the reasons that nobody ever wants to talk about uh, about cutting any program specifically, because now it opens up a window of attack, and now you have all these special interest groups that don't want to lose that benefit that are now going to be organized and motivated uh, to uh, mobilize the troops and spend a bunch of money to defeat you because they've got this skin at the game. They don't want to lose what they have. But to the extent that Trump can, you know, keep all those forces at bay so that nobody perceives they're going to lose any government benefits, he's just going to come in there and save us a bunch of money from waste, fraud and abuse and negotiate all these great deals. And through the power of his business acumen and how how smart he is and how successful he is, that all that is going to translate into making the entire country successful to the extent that people believe that they're going to vote for him. But I can't get on board and endorse that because I know that's not true. And I can't basically say, well, let's just vote for Trump because he's probably lying about all this stuff and he's probably not going to do most of the stuff that he's uh, that he's claiming he's going to do. He's going to do something different. I don't know. I hope, I hope he does something different. And even, even if he believes some of this stuff, that when he gets into office and if he really does surround himself by people who, who want to make America great, not a bunch of politicians, maybe some of the people he surrounds himself with will clue him in as to what really needs to be done to accomplish this task. And if we really want to bring these high paying jobs back to America, tariffs are not the way to do it. Tariffs are just going to cause even more of these jobs to be destroyed even more rapidly, that there is a real cause, there is a real disease here, and we need to treat that disease. We just can't try to treat the symptoms and expect the disease to go away. We've got to get to the root cause of that disease, and that is big government. And Donald Trump is not any more competent or capable of efficiently running big government than any of the career politicians that are in there now, because nobody could do that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's in charge. It's never going to work. The only thing that will work is dismantling that government. And hopefully Trump will surprise me and be the guy to do it, because I certainly know that Hillary Clinton is not going to be the one that's going to do that. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. 
Truth in Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into the Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They're all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.